Hello, folks. Um, as folks are trickling in here, give it just a second. Um, I want to go ahead and kick us off with a quick welcome and a thank you to everyone for joining us today. My name is Rachel Wesson. I am the Events and Communications Specialist at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, uh, one of the co-sponsors of today's launch event for the UC Berkeley AI Risk Management Standards Profile for General Purpose AI Systems, GPAIS, and Foundation Models, which is definitely the longest event title I've ever had to say in my tenure at CLTC. Um, so thank you, Tony, for that honor. Um, but it is truly a pleasure to welcome you all to today's discussion, um, which is also brought to you by the AI Security Initiative at CLTC and the Citrus Policy Lab at the Citrus and Banatow Institute. And I will now turn things over to one of our co-moderators for the discussion, uh, Jessica Newman, who is the director of the AI Security Initiative here at CLTC, as well as the co-director of the UC Berkeley AI Policy Hub. Um, so Jessica, over to you. Thanks so much, Rachel, and hi, everyone. I'm really excited to welcome you all here today for the launch of the UC Berkeley AI Risk Management Standards Profile for General Purpose AI Systems and Foundation Models. So as many of you know, the team's been working on this for the last year, and we want to take this opportunity to say thank you to so many of you from so many different communities who have been part of this whole process with us, joining for multiple workshops and providing feedback on the earlier draft versions of the profile. We're really grateful for all of the time and support of this project. Uh, in addition to CLTC and the AI Security Initiative, I also want to thank our partner organization, the Citrus Policy Lab, for helping to organize this event today and for general and ongoing support of the project. So our event is coming on the heels of a very busy week for AI policy. There are so many important initiatives happening here in the U.S. and abroad, and we're excited to help connect the dots today between this profile and the broader context and environment of policy and governance efforts uh, for cutting edge AI systems. So we have a great panel of speakers joining us today who will be able to speak to that really concretely. So thank you also to all the speakers for joining us for the launch event today. Uh, next slide, please. So quick overview of the agenda for our hour together. You already heard some of the logistics and next we're gonna dive into an overview of the profile that will be led by Tony and Crystal. They'll cover key terms and risk topics and then get into the highest priority risk management steps, including some examples, uh, as well as talk about some of the plans for the next year. We'll then have a panel discussion with our distinguished guest speakers and then wrap up with some final closing thoughts. So with that, let me pass it over to Tony uh, to uh, dive in. Thanks all. Thank you very much, uh, Jess and Rachel and uh, to the entire team and to everyone uh, joining us today. I uh, appreciate you making the time. Um, so as you heard, um, we're launching today version 1.0 of uh, this AI Risk Management Standards Profile for General Purpose AI Systems, or uh, GPIS. Uh, and you'll see that acronym a lot. Um, and uh, foundation models, generative AI, and uh, frontier models. We'll talk a little bit uh, about the those terms in just a sec. Um, this uh, document is intended as a uh, contribution to standards on AI safety and uh, trustworthiness, safety, security, accountability, and, and so on. Um, this provides uh, risk management uh, best practices or controls for identifying, analyzing, and mitigating uh, risks of such systems. This guidance is intended primarily for uh, use by developers of uh, such systems, but also uh, can be uh, valuable for uh, developers or de of uh, downstream applications built on uh, these types of systems, it can be valuable for evaluators, uh, regulators, um, users, and, and so on. Our effort is separate from, but aims to complement and inform uh, rel other related efforts such as the Partnership in AI Guidance for Safe Foundation Model Deployment and the NIST Generative AI Public Working Group. Um, they are working on a separate uh, NIST uh, ARMF profile specifically for generative AI. Um, this we, We've been working on this um, in one form or another for over a year now. 
Uh, we've been doing uh, research within our team. Um, we've been engaging with a number of stakeholders, um, many of whom are on um, this um, uh, event right now. And uh, thank you again to everyone who's provided uh, input and feedback uh, as, as part of this process. Um, we've we've um, conducted several virtual workshops and made uh, two full drafts publicly available on the Berkeley CLTC webpage. Um, tested application of the draft guidance to uh, four recently released uh, foundation models. You'll hear a little bit about that feasibility testing. Um, we welcome feedback on this uh, version 1.0 uh, release. We certainly don't think um, this is uh, a one and done uh, type of exercise. Um, we uh, we plan at least one update over the coming year and um, we'll um, very much welcome your feedback. Um, if anybody wants to serve as a um, user providing feedback, um, if you're a developer of large language model or other uh, foundation model, I'd love to um, work with you uh, to do that and, and get your feedback, applying our guidance as you uh, develop and uh, release um, that um, system. Um, okay, terminology, uh, general purpose AI systems. Um, this is um, this includes large language models, uh, multimodal uh, generative um, models. Um, we're, we're treating this um, as essentially a, an umbrella term that also includes foundation models, frontier models, and generative AI, except where we need to be more specific in referring uh, to one of those. Um, so uh, foundation model um, is essentially um, a large scale, uh, high capability subset of pre-trained uh, general purpose um, AI systems uh, trained on relatively large data sets resulting in relatively large size pre-trained models, uh, often deployed in a way that uh, results in large numbers of users. A uh, frontier model is essentially the, the largest scale, most capable subset of foundation models, um, typically with record-breaking uh, amounts of compute used in training, record-breaking model size, and, and so on. Generative AI um, uh, specifically is um, an AI, any AI system whose primary function is to generate content. Um, one thing you may notice um, is that um, the primary examples it, we're going to be talking about large language models and multimodal models such as GPT-4 and um, uh, other um, somewhat comparable systems. Um, these systems, especially the, the leading examples of these systems, uh, are exam they fit into each of these categories. Uh, they are a general purpose AI system. They are a foundation model. GPT-4 right now is essentially um, one of it, it's at or near the uh, frontier of uh, currently available models. And of course, it is um, generative AI. Our guidance is uh, structured uh, around the NIST AI risk management framework. Um, we do also have mapping in section four of, uh, sorry, yeah, section four of the document, mapping to ISO IEC 23894, um, as well as a pointer to mapping uh, to ISO IEC 42001 uh, for um, users of those international AI standards. But we have it laid out according to the NIST AI risk management framework. And the way the AI RMF works um, is that they have four uh, core functions uh, focused on activities and outcomes of um, uh, particular types. Um, the uh, govern function it focuses on roles and responsibilities for risk management processes. Uh, map is for identifying risks and context. Measures for uh, risk and trustworthiness metrics and manage is for those risk management decisions, uh, risk mitigation controls, and so on. And uh, profiles such as ours can provide supplemental guidance for specific uh, AI technologies or use cases, um, and so on. So when we talk about risk in the profile um, and when we talk about impacts and so on, um, we're talking about um, at least three uh, dimensions of risks or potential impacts, and they are um, treat they are uh, addressed in um, at least three different areas in the profile. And first is um, in map uh, 1.1. These are um, reasonably foreseeable impacts of uh, AI development and deployment. These include impacts to individuals including potentially um, impacts to health, safety, well-being, or uh, human rights, impacts to groups, including populations vulnerable to uh, disproportionate um, impacts or harms, impacts to society, including environmental impacts, 
um, in um, map five under map 5.1, we outline a number of uh, factors that could uh, lead to uh, significant, severe, or catastrophic harms. Uh, these include uh, cases where uh, there could be uh, correlated uh, large-scale uh, bias and discrimination, impacts to societal trust or democratic processes, uh, for example, uh, from uh, uh, misinformation or disinformation affecting elections, uh, correlated robustness failures, um, and uh, so on, um, including a number of uh, factors that uh, might uh, be um, present in uh, more advanced um, AI systems uh, a generation or two uh, uh, ahead of what we might be seeing now, but things that um, uh, we should be looking out for um, at this point, including, uh, for example, uh, loss of understanding and control of an AI system in a real world context. Um, under uh, measure two, um, there are a number of AI trustworthiness characteristics. These follow, uh, broadly speaking, the um, uh, structure uh, that both ARMF and also IEC, ISO IEC 23894 um, outline. So uh, safety, reliability, and robustness, security and resiliency under uh, measure 2.7, uh, fairness and bias under measure 2.11, and so on. The, in the executive summary and section two of the profile, we outline uh, what we consider um, the 11 um, or the, the high, high priority risk management steps for um, users of the profile. Uh, if you want to be uh, saying that you are following the guidance in the profile, then you should be sure to um, at least do what's outlined uh, for these uh, particular uh, steps in the associated um, ARMF uh, subcategories. Um, so under ma uh, manage 1.1, 1 .1, um, the, um, the, the main uh, guidance here is to, uh, or one, one key aspect of it is to check or update and incorporate each of the following steps when making go or no-go decisions on uh, development or uh, deployment of uh, cutting edge large scale uh, general purpose AI, especially frontier uh, AI systems. Take responsibility for risk assessment and risk management uh, tasks for which your organization uh, has comparative advantage or at least sufficient advantage to take constructive action. Um, in the um, in, uh, this, we're, we're looking in particular at outlining what responsibilities the original developers of these foundation models uh, should be taking on, but we also outline responsibilities um, areas where downstream developers would have comparative advantage. Um, set risk tolerance thresholds to prevent unacceptable risks, uh, which include cases where significant negative impacts are imminent, severe harms are actually occurring, or catastrophic risks are present. Um, identify the potential uses and misuses or abuses uh, for uh, one of these systems, and identify reasonably foreseeable impacts um, or potential impacts. Uh, for example, to uh, fundamental rights. Identify whether uh, one of these systems could lead to significant, severe, or catastrophic impacts. Use red teams in adversarial testing uh, to identify dangerous capabilities, vulnerabilities, or other emergent properties of such systems. Track important identified risks, um, even if they cannot, even if you don't have good benchmarks for them, at least like keep them on your radar screen in, in a risk register or other uh, system for, uh, in order to periodically revisit them. Uh, implement risk reduction controls as appropriate throughout the system lifecycle, and incorporate identified um, AI system risk factors um, and um, associated circumstances that could result in impacts or harms in uh, reporting to stakeholders as appropriate, for example, using model cards and, or other um, documentation. The next couple of slides, I, I have um, some uh, examples of um, guidance um, I'm just going to touch on these very briefly. Um, you have access to the uh, full uh, guidance document right now, so um, you can see uh, what we have there. So uh, one, for measure 1.1, I, I talked about red team um, procedures. Uh, part of our guidance there is to actually use uh, red teams and adversarial testing as part of um, interaction with these uh, systems to identify dangerous capabilities, vulnerabilities, or other emergent properties. Uh, one of One aspect of our guidance here is to uh, not only have that be uh, um, done by internal teams, but also by external teams, partner with an independent red teaming organization as appropriate. For um, cybersecurity uh, guidelines under measure uh, 2.7, we have some guidance here on protecting 
uh, model weights uh, for proprietary or unreleased models. This essentially points to um, guidance uh, from uh, NIST or ISO IEC uh, 27001 or an approximate equivalent. And uh, we also have some guidance for developers who plan to release a model um, you know, on an open source uh, basis or another um, open access uh, approach that would allow um, downloading of the model weights. Um, and essentially our guidance here, um, is, or part of our guidance here is before you release uh, model weights in a way that's uh, downloadable, um, then uh, you, you first um, you should, uh, among other uh, risk mitigations, um, you should um, uh, you should first um, use a structured access um, uh, approach where uh, you can monitor how people are using it, and if uh, unexpected harms um, or misuses uh, or other emergent properties um, of the system uh, begin to uh, uh, show up, then um, you can make corresponding changes. Once you've released that model, and the model weights in a downloadable fashion, then you can't really uh, decommission uh, the resulting AI systems that others build with the uh, with those model weights. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn this over to uh, my colleague uh, Crystal, who uh, performed feasibility testing. And uh, please uh, go ahead, Crystal. Thank you, Tony. So also as part of this work, we conducted a feasibility test by assessing our profile guidance against four large-scale foundation models, um, GPT-4, Claude 2 Palm-2, and Llama-2. For each of these models, we measured the extent of fulfillment for 11 out of the 72 subcategories of the profile, um, those 11 subcategories being the high priority ones that um, Tony highlighted earlier. Um, we did this by leveraging publicly available information, such as technical reports, model cards, blog posts, and documented assessments. Um, and this analysis basically allowed us to do two main things. It allowed us to, one, test the feasibility of our recommended guidance against the risk management actions that were already being performed by developers to ensure that our, our guidance was both applicable and reasonable. And we updated several pieces of our final profile guidance as a result. Uh, and secondly, it provided some illustrative examples of how one would apply our guidance to a real world model. Um, this also generated some recommendations for the model developers themselves. And um, however, there were some limitations to this process in our testing. So these tests were retrospective in nature. And in an ideal situation, developers who are part of these uh, organizations would apply this guidance across the software development lifecycle. We were also limited to public information and we only assessed some of the profile guidance, um, just a sliver of it. And um, as a result, this testing should be seen as an approximate indicator of a given model's fulfillment against the high priority subcategories of our profile. Next slide, please. So here are the results of our testing. We had four different uh, scoring categories, unclear when there simply wasn't enough information for us to make a determination of fulfillment, and then low, medium, and high fulfillment, depending on how much of the recommended guidance for a given subcategory was addressed in the documentation. The main thing to highlight here is that overall, these models scored very similarly to one another for any given subcategory. And another highlight is that there are um, gaps in uh, current practices where none of the model developers had publicly available information on their risk management practices at the time of our assessment. Um, this really highlights some exciting areas for future governance and risk management work to be done. Next slide, please. Some other key um, results from this analysis were um, we decided to add additional guidance on the organizational decision to disclose risk tolerance thresholds and risk assessments. Uh, and we did this in the executive summary in section two. Um, in many cases, model information should be kept private, so we address the appropriateness of sharing information at different levels, whether that be private, um, with auditors or evaluators, or for public. Uh, we also added a more nuanced approach to the question of managing risk for open access or open source models to give developers who choose that path more actionable guidance. Overall, this testing really demonstrates that our profile guidance was largely um, applicable and feasible for model developers to apply for their future risk assessments. Um, thank you. I'll hand it back over to you, Tony. Thank you very much, Crystal. Uh, so at this point, 
Um, as of today, the profile version 1.0 is available as a free resource uh, for developers, evaluators, or others. Um, going forward, um, you know, we see this as, as we mentioned, we intend this as a contribution to standards in this area, uh, widespread norms and standards for using practices such as in this profile um, can help ensure that developers of foundation models and similar systems can be competitive without compromising on practices for AI safety, security, accountability, and related issues. As I mentioned, we're planning on for at least one update over the next year. Um, we'll be incorporating new practices, uh, resources, adding mappings to a new standards and codes of conduct and so on. Um, we'd love to get your uh, feedback and we'll consider that um, as we uh, work on uh, refinements for uh, uh, future versions. Um, so please uh, don't, don't hesitate to um, email us uh, to if you um, have um, suggestions for improvement or if you would like to, if you have questions or if you would like to apply this yourself. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it over to um, my uh, team members and they are going to have a very interesting panel discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Tony. Hello, everybody. I'm Brandy Nanaki. I'm the director of the Citrus Policy Lab and co-director of the AI Policy Hub with Jessica Newman. Also, I'm the host of a TV show called Tech Hype, where we debunk misunderstandings around emerging technologies and technology policy. We'll be releasing a short video about the White House Executive Order on AI, so I'll put in the chat our URL because I'd love for y'all to check it out. So I'm honored to serve as the moderator of our panel today. So I'll first introduce the panelists. We'll have about a 20 minute discussion then we're going to open it up for q a if you could please put your questions in the q a box um, starting now that'd be great so that those questions are already queued up for us so let me get started by introducing our panelists i'll ask that you please turn on your camera so that everybody can see you perfect timing ian i'm going to first introduce ian eisenberg head of ai governance research at credo ai Next, Sabrina Kuspert, a seconded policy expert at Mercator Foundation. Next, we have Christabel Randolph, who serves as a public interest fellow at the Georgetown University Law Center. And last but not least, Apostol Vasilev, research supervisor at NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Your ears must be ringing, Apostle, uh, hearing about uh, NIST being called out so much in the White House executive order on AI. I saw there's going to be some, some definite uh, job openings happening at NIST to, to respond to that executive order. Thank you, Brandy. Yeah, it's been busy days. I can imagine. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I have a few questions to get us started. Would love for us to engage in discussion. Feel free to you know comment on each other's ideas, maybe even push back. I don't know. This could be an interesting morning. So my first question, there has been sort of this tension around, well, why do we actually need risk management specifically for these general purpose AI systems and foundation models? Um, even in the White House Executive Order on AI, um, many of you probably noticed that there is sort of this proxy between compute power and risk, um, sort of flagging those systems that are using a lot of compute power as potentially higher risk. I I'm seeing a lot of pushback on that. I'd love to hear from all of you whether or not you think that pushback is justified. So the first question is, why is risk management needed for general purpose AI and foundation models? Well, maybe if you allow me, I can uh, start with uh, an opinion on this topic. AI is a transformative technology and none more so than these generative models or base um, foundational models. Um, so they're going to impact many aspects of business and life of people and society. It's a technology that evolves rapidly, especially the frontier models, as we've seen it, it seems like every week there is news around them. And as a result, many of the models' capabilities and vulnerabilities are not fully understood and characterized. This creates potential risks for misuse, abuse, and with adverse impacts on people, um, businesses, and society. And if left unmanaged, these risks can lead to harmful outcomes and rejection of the AI technology, thus undermining the great potential it has for improving the quality of our lives. And so um, 
I think this is why it is important to have a systematic approach to AI risk management as defined by the NIST AI RMS uh, framework and this profile specifically for foundation models. Great. Thank you, Pascal. Sabrina, I'm seeing you uh, doing some nodding in agreement. So I'd love to turn to you and hear your thoughts. Yeah, I would love to add to that. And thanks, Apostol. Um, so in my former work with the think tank um, SNV in Germany, we also kind of like looked at these distinct challenges that German purpose AI models pose um, so that they can be effectively governed that are somewhat different to like other um, basically challenges that we see in other AI systems. And one um, you, you addressed, right, which comes down to, okay, maybe right now we do not have a solution how to ensure that these models um, behave robustly as they are intended to behave. Um, and they are deployed in like ever more complex tasks and they operate in ever wider range of contexts. Like right now, there are only very few well-resourced actors in the world that have released these models, but like hundreds of end users already use them and this scale is like further increased by potentially thousands of applications building on them. And like, just if you look at the scale, I think that makes it quite unique. And now that we've seen that the diversity of risks of these models have been recognized also by policy interventions around the world, it's, you know, an obvious thing to say, okay, well, they're risks, so let's manage them. And I think that's great where like this risk management profile comes in and allows for an informed debate about the severity and the likelihood of risks and you basically see the full risk landscape. Uh, thank you so much, Sabrina. And this comes on the heels of the OpenAI Dev Day, right? Where Sam Altman announced that they're going to open it up for anybody to create these GPTs. So yes, it, it's going to get into the hands of so many people. It's not just OpenAI, but others using it and creating on top of it. Uh, Ian, yes, you're nodding in agreement, which means I'm going to call on you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I just want to bring up, I guess, Oh, there we go. I, I just want to bring up maybe the the other side that I sometimes implicitly comes up when people are saying, why shouldn't you govern foundation models? Is my video freezing right now? Um, it is, but we can hear you. <laughs> OK, I'm going to I'm going to change to this this other one, which is the, this idea that the application layer is the only layer that needs to be applied. Why does it matter to kind of regulate these general purpose systems? But I think as Sabrina brings up, these general purpose systems are um, making it very easy to build a humongous range of applications, moving from individual users to just quickly standing up very impactful systems that can relate to hiring or healthcare or any other kind of form. That's one aspect. And then the other that Apostle brought up is just this pace of improvement that leads to humongous uncertainties that requires um, additional focus on the level of this kind of infrastructure that we're building. I really think that that kind of metaphor for these foundation models as infrastructure is the right level. And of course, we would put a number of risk reducing um, kind of measures in place for our infrastructure so that the rest of society can kind of move um, effectively, efficiently with kind of um, uh, a feeling of trust towards the infrastructure they're building out, leading to just an overall more efficient system. Yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for bringing up trust, uh, not just trust in machines, but trust in the humans who are overseeing the machines uh, and making sure that we have this robust governance process. Uh, Christabel, I want to give you an opportunity to comment on this question um, if you have something, but we can also transition to the next question. So I'll, I'll hand it to you. I think I just want to make one point. Uh, whenever we talk about AI and general purpose AI and everything is accelerating so fast, we talk like, you know, the terminology itself has accelerated so fast in the last one year. The only point I'd like to make is that we should avoid a sort of tech exceptionalism. Why govern? We govern a new drug. We govern a new product that's released mm -hmm. into market. Anything that's integral to our daily lives, all kinds of infrastructure, as Ian and Sabrina said. So my question is not why should we govern or why should we have risk management for AI systems? My question is, why shouldn't we have it? And of course, it's very simple. I mean, from the very important, we talk about national security and we talk about biosecurity risks, and there are so many um, aspects that are being considered. But from a very basic level, we see that these products and services and tools are going to be integrated 
into our daily lives in classrooms, in healthcare, in uh, making you know credit decisions, and that's why we need to have appropriate risk management um, and governance frameworks. Yes, outstanding point. And I think it's pretty clear that members of Congress and legislatures and governments around the world are sort of waking up to the fact that oh, we kind of slept on uh, regulating platforms over the past 20 years. Maybe we should uh, pay more attention to regulating these new emerging technologies. So my next question, which is a really great segue from this discussion right now, is not whether we should regulate, but how. How should we govern these technologies? So I'd love to hear from you all. What are the highest priority risk management actions or mitigations that we can implement for these general purpose AI and foundation models? Uh, I can start here. So I think one of the things that sometimes comes up in um, a debate around risk management is needing to balance benefits and the harms. And so like, you know, some people um, focus, feel like we focus too much on, uh, on, on the harm. So the two kind of priorities that I think are necessary for us at this point are one on evaluations specifically. We need to understand both how these systems work in a more diverse area. We talked about general purpose systems, the huge range of different downstream applications need a truly like tremendous number of evaluations that we just haven't built yet. And the second is transparent reporting. One of the things that comes up in this profile many times is the complexity of the value chain and the need for different actors to kind of act within their greater information and get information from others who have better information about other aspects of the system. So evaluations are are critical to kind of support the information, but transparent reporting is the only thing that will allow us to have that information flow effectively through the value chain. On that, Ian, though, I would like to ask, well, what does transparency actually mean in practice? Uh, so when we have these transparency reports, what should be included? Maybe like Sabrina um, or Apostle or Christabel, would you like to comment on that? Happy to jump in here. Um, actually, um, just to to add, so right now I'm so I'm seconded from the Mercator Foundation to work um, with the European Commission on the AI Act. And I think when you mentioned, you know, um, transparency obligations and w- how to govern these models, then I think like the EU has thought about this uh, for quite a while and um, has also thought about their own purpose AI models before the entire ChatGPT hype happened. Um, so that's actually great. And to to add to what you mentioned, Ian, that there needs to be transparency um, and we need to understand the risks and we also need to understand the incidents. I think what's been remarkable that at the UK AI Safety Summit, um, Ursula von der Leyen, so the president of the European Commission, she actually also outlined that the greater the AI model capabilities and the attendant risks, the greater is the responsibility. But simultaneously, third parties, including governments, and especially here governments, they're ultimately responsible for the safety of the citizens, right? And so what she, for example, there suggested um, is that an, an AI office, and there are like many institutes right now being built also in the US and in the UK, kind of like they could be like a central node for actually, you know, like gathering this information and understand, like investigating major incidents that occur Um understanding what trusted flaggers um, report to them and then basically having this as like an an infrastructure that supports the wider ecosystem um, to then carry out the risk management. Exactly. And we're seeing the same approach in the United States in the White House executive order on AI. There would be reporting requirements for these large models to the federal government. Now, whether or not that will be made publicly available and how is, I think, yet to be understood. Uh, Christabel and Apostle, what do you think are the highest priority risk management actions we need to implement? Maybe let's go with Christabel first. Yeah, so I think um, a couple of thoughts come to mind. And of course, the EU AI Act is sort of laying the baseline in terms of what transparency and governance should look like. The thing is, AI is a moving target. And I think we need to acknowledge that whenever we talk about transparency or governance and what kind of disclosure would be required. So um you know, it, it may seem a bit um, confusing at times that what do we do, but these all can be broken down. And I think what um, CLTC has done 
uh, you know, great, uh, great work in the profile is acknowledging the other standard setting bodies that would be actually breaking down model weights, documentation requirement. You know, we have stochastic parrots that talk about really the level of documentation that would be required to ensure that there's transparency. The EU AI Act talks about registries. So there are already ideas. Are they perfect? Uh, we will see because it's also, like I said, it's a moving target and regulation will have to be really responsive. The only point that I would make, however we design transparency, and there are a lot of different suggestions, and I think there's a lot of consensus coming on these suggestions in terms of disclosing the documentation, making sure that the impact assessments are done before you deploy a system so that people can actually see whether this system is a go, no-go decision. And from the work that I do, that's a very critical area. Should we actually deploy a system? Should I have a generative AI system talking to my three-year-old, right? And um, those critical decisions should be enabled by transparency and governance frameworks. Right. You brought up a really excellent point about, you know, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. And there's this knee-jerk reaction to criticize any regulatory or legislative proposal, right? You see the headlines right after the White House executive order on AI is announced that it falls too short, uh, everything. But also no legislation or regulation or executive order is perfect. It can't be. So I actually want to go to you, Apostle. I want to um, ask you about what areas in this world of, okay, we can't reach perfection, but we're going to get as close as we can with the tools that, and knowledge that we have right now. What areas of risk management do you think are particularly important? And how do you see our profile playing a role in that? Well, to answer partly this question and to piggyback on the theme of transparency that we just talked about, one of the important uh, aspects of transparency are the data sets used to train these models. And um, from a public uh, standpoint, um, we see very few models where the data sets that are used in training are actually documented and available to uh, the public. And one aspect of, of the data sets uh, themselves is that they point to the question of the, the problem of scale associated with it. Think of it. If you look at the web, uh, web crawls that are used to collect the data for these models, there is no single business or let alone country that contains all this data that is being used in a given model. And that question of scale is a very, very difficult one and presents many risks that are pretty much novel risks that humanity and technology as a whole hasn't dealt with. Uh, up until this point, we had our um, corporate boundaries. We owned all the data inside. We learned how to build some controls and protect it and so on. Now, our, our playing field is the internet as a whole. So how do you deal with this thing? And what does it mean to, um, to know what your data is? And what are the possibilities for abuse, uh, poisoning, all these things? So these are a whole new set of challenges, not to mention the copyright challenges that pop up <laughs> everywhere. Yes, and so, exactly. um, so, so that's really um, a difficult problem that requires a lot of thought uh, before we can get a good handle on it. Yeah, and not to mention copyright, but also data protection. Um, if your data is pulled into a model and you have rights over that data, how do you remove yourself from that? Uh, so I actually see some questions popping into the Q&A, and I want to give our participants time to be able to have their questions asked. I encourage anybody who is here listening, please, please add your question to the Q&A. So let me actually jump into this first question from Renata Barreto. Uh, how would existing risk frameworks apply to situations such as deploying chatbots in healthcare settings? Sam Altman recently said that these systems could provide medical um, care to people who can't afford care. This essentially creates a two-tiered system for the wealthy who have access to physicians versus the poor who are sort of relegated to a stochastic model that only predicts the next word in a sentence? I, I think this question, I mean, I think the, the question of equity throughout our society and how these kind of technologies roll out is of course very important. But I think this question is a bit too pessimistic about where AI is going. 
I do not think that the systems that we're creating right now are merely stochastic models or like merely stochastic parrots in the way that is, is putting forward here. I think we are at a precipice of truly raising the bottom to an incredible, incredibly high level in both what people can get in terms of physicians, personal assistants, educators. There are so many opportunities here that I think Apostle brought this up at the very beginning. One of the worries we have is that by flubbing these like early years with AI systems and, tr and not safeguarding them well enough, we will have kind of a kind of uh, a, a public turn on this technology where the benefits are not seen and the risks are magnified and we don't take advantage of them moving forward. So I guess the response I'd have here is we already have tiered systems where people with means have access to you know, healthcare in this case, people without means do not. And there is a promise here where these AI systems actually democratize access to a much higher degree of many different kinds of services. And our goal in risk management and governance is to make sure that we move towards that future effectively and don't kind of, I, I find this slightly reactionary here to, to think that our current issues with our AI systems aren't going to be dealt with over the years. And actually, I mean, the elephants in the room as uh, a scholar in the field, there is this tension happening right now with, between sort of those who um, like the hype versus reality and the hype on either utopian or dystopian and people are following along that continuum. I'd love to hear from others. You know, are we going to reach that point where we can actually harness these uh, technologies in a way that support efficiency, effectiveness and equity in society? Christabel. Yeah, so I think with AI and healthcare, this is interesting because it's also something that I've just recently started working on. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't understand that AI ML systems have been used in clinical procedures, um, in clinical testing since the 90s. So one is to get some perspective. It's like when we talk about AI systems, what exactly do we mean? Do we mean it in clinical? Do we mean it in imaging? What are the use cases? But if we're talking about diagnostic services where I am used to speaking to a doctor or I'm used to speaking to a healthcare provider, would I allow an AI system to replace a healthcare provi provider, uh, a certified professional? And I think those are the questions we need to ask. Um, it's not about um, there are endless use cases. And as Ian said that, yes, probably we shouldn't be pessimistic about it, but in order to be optimistic, we need to call out certain areas where, like I said, the go, no go decisions. And I think that's captured really well in your profile as well is where do we take that go, no go decision and decide, do I want an AI system, a conversational AI system to replace a certified health professional? That's a question we need to ask. And for that, we need transparency to see how exactly does the system work? Does it live up to the healthcare expectations? It's not just an equity. It's also a more fundamental question. And if it is able, if we find systems, if we have beneficial use cases, then yes, maybe it can expand um, equity and access in healthcare. I love this. And um, you're reminding me of the, the phrase, not whether we can, but should we? And this also gets back, I love that you brought up too, that look, this isn't a new space. We've been using data and analytics for decades in various high risk settings. So I wonder also if this increased attention toward AI and generative AI might also encourage us to look back and think about, well, are there some areas where we should no longer be using data analytics or be using them in a different way? So there's a couple more questions here, and I'd love to hear from Sabrina and Apostle, um, because I haven't heard y'all from y'all in a minute. Uh, Nicole Lemke asks, what would be the preferred setup for an institution, such as an AI office, to ensure responsive regulation? What would be the key requirements of that office? So I guess the first question is, should there be an office? And then if there should, which, what role should it play? We have possible, let's start with you maybe first, because you said at NIST, which is called out uh, very frequently in the uh, White House Executive Order on AI. Well, I'm probably the, the right choice here because NIST is a non-regulatory institution and we pride ourselves with uh, having the status that which allows us to engage freely with uh, with industry and other uh, institutions in order to develop world class standards, and uh, that's why I will defer to Sabrina for this answer. 
<laughs> but no, but Apostle, that's part of the answer is that there shouldn't necessarily be, there should be this independent entity that can provide guidance. So you did answer the question, but Sabrina, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, quickly to add to that. Um, yeah, so I think like in... And the course of the AI Act, you know, it's obvious that, of course, there needs to be some regulatory capacity that needs to be built. Um, in this case, I mean, we haven't closed the AI Act yet, so it's all under discussions. Um, what has been also publicly discussed last week is that there is this idea for, for example, a European AI office. And of course, for example, one key feature would, of course, be that such an entity would also want to collaborate with similar entities around the world, because I think for whatever risk you're looking at, um, if we're considering risks from general purpose AI models, then these would just basically, they, they wouldn't be contained in like one country, right? So they would also scale globally. So this could be one key feature um, to consider that there needs to be like a certain level of cooperation um, to help us guide this technology responsibly together. Great. Yes, absolutely. If there isn't anything that's become more abundantly clear is how interconnected the world is, especially around AI. And of course, we have the Geneva effect and the California effect, right, where globally we're affected by the decisions that are made within the European Union and within the state of California. Um, one question I want to put forward, I, I love this question from Sawyer Burnath. It's always important to think about with your best laid intentions, what might actually go awry. So how do you think this profile, our profile, might actually fail to have an impact or might have a negative impact? How can we reduce the chance of that outcome? You, you know, I sometimes see people um, ask questions like, are you compliant with the NIST RMF, for, for instance, or this profile? And that means that the from that perspective, it makes the RMF, this very heavy burden that you have to be fully compliant with to get benefit from, rather than an informative document that helps you take the next step along your, your kind of journey towards being a more responsible steward of the AI systems that you're building. And I think the same towards this profile. This is a comprehensive document. It covers a lot of stuff, and that can be overwhelming at first, and so if you're entering in like, oh, I either, okay, is this the document that I need to kind of subscribe to? Then many organizations are probably going to say, no, I can't possibly do that. And so, you know, kind of narrativizing this document in a way that it's like, there are many steps that you can take from here to create a kind of prioritized journey as you move to make, be an ever more perfect kind of responsible steward is I think the right framing, but if, if that framing isn't taken, I think there's sometimes a, a tendency to, to reject it as kind of overwhelming. Yeah, and, and we're hearing that more and more frequently. And that is a common trope that let's just put it out there that industry is using to say, this is completely overwhelming. We don't even know what compliance looks like, but you bring up a good point. Well, you don't actually have to be compliant within this AI RMF. It is voluntary at the moment. Of course, we know that legislation is being proposed that essentially puts in the language of the NIST AI RMF or, or says you should use something like the NIST AI RMF. Um, Cristobal and Sabrina, I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on, well, how might we actually be able to implement the profile in a way that sort of calms these fears and tells, you know, informs people just do due diligence, just try your best to mitigate those risks. Happy to go first. Um, yeah, so on, on this one, I mean, it's of course always, you know, like at, um, basically like there's this gradient between um, self-regulation and then like the actual regulation that, that's being put in place, right? So again, if we take um, the example of the AI Act um, at this point, so the AI Act will be adopted the ambition is that it's being adopted early 2024 and then there are like certain obligations so it's like you know like basically the, the principles of the obligations are in the law but then of course you have to detail that out right and so there will be guidance that then puts this into place and i really hope that like such guidance then draws on the experience of uh, for example like independent researchers such as it's you see Berkeley that you know like started to develop this and then you know you you try to put it into guidance but of course there are always other ways to you know demonstrate that you're actually mitigating these risks so it's just one one option for this. 
Um, I think it's also what you're intending to do with this system or technology, right? Um, if you're intending to, you know, use it to summarize some of your research, probably, or develop a, a, a GPT-like tool that would be more efficient and targeted and summarizing research, that would be one um, assessment of how do you comply? Do you need to comply with the full profile? There are, are there only specific parts? And I think that's pretty easy to identify. But if you're developing a system which will feed into driverless cars, then obviously I think your impact assessment would be very, very different. And I think you should be mindful of that. You should recognize that, that what am I really intending to do with the system and accordingly map uh, the risks or the parts of the profile that I am, you know, I need to comply with, I need to take care of. And I, and Again, I think like, you know, let's avoid the tech exceptionalism. This is not new corporate governance, risk management, all of these things from environmental protection to drugs to, I, I mean, there are so many cases where this has been sometimes a precursor to regulation, but in a, a lot of times a follow up to how to better comply with regulation, right? It depends on how a specific sector has evolved. But again, let's just stress that you need to recognize what are the potential impacts that your system, what are you intending it to have? And then accordingly identify what are the governance steps that you need to take. Right. And uh, my next question picks up on what you're saying right now, Christabel, and then some of the points that Sabrina and Ian made. Um, we do see this sort of burgeoning new sector of third party auditors, certifiers, licensors who will go to these companies and say, look, we know you need to navigate this crazy space right now, right? They're going to hype it up to sell their, their service of compliance and, you know, doing the NIST AI risk management framework, EU conformity assessments, whatever, hand it to us and we'll do it for you. But how do we assess those third parties to ensure that they're doing a robust enough job? Um, I'd like to take that. I mean, you know, um, the, the the usual saying is you should put your money where your mouth is. If we see public accountants, there's a lot, there's an oversight board and it's also regulated. So if there's somebody who's actually doing audits and certifications for such uh, profound, uh, impactful systems, which like are going to constitute infrastructure, critical infrastructure going forward, then obviously there should also be some oversight of the people carrying out these assessments. Thank you. Others? Well, I would say another factor is establishing good, actionable standards that these people can work off of so that we know and can verify their work as well, not just take it at the face value. Uh, because remember, we're dealing with risk management. And the risk management doesn't mean that you eliminate the risk altogether. It means that you have to learn to live with the risk budget. And therefore, there's always the uh, possibility of a failure, even if you did your best to follow a specific standard. That doesn't mean that you the standard is bad or you, it failed. It's just the nature of business we're dealing with. So that's another way to look at it, to, pick, to go back to Ian's point of, you know, wh what do we do? How do we say that we're failing in, in this case or in that case? So the mindset of dealing with uh, uh, probabilities and, and risk management is, um, somewhat confusing to people, and and so we need to um, we need to adapt to that. Exactly, and Apostle bringing up this point of you can do your best and still fail, and this is in in the law of due diligence. Did you actually try to mitigate the risk versus negligence, where you might have known some risks were there, but you continued without putting in appropriate safeguards? I have one final lightning round question before we do a closeout. So my final question um, for all of you is, well, what else is needed? Where should risk management standards for general purpose AI systems and foundation models go from here? And to make it quicker, I'm just going to call on you each. So Sabrina, you go first. What do we need? <laughs> So you mentioned earlier this point of, you know, like hype versus reality when people are talking about risks. I think what I would wish is just that when we're thinking about, okay, risk assessment and mitigation, then let's just ensure some broad recognition. I think uh, UC Berkeley already in your work, you did that, um, ensuring that like a broad range of stakeholders are involved in this. So it's just basically keep up, keep up the good work. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Ian. 
I think one thing that sometimes happens in regulation or like people have technological solutions for certain safety issues and then there are regulators who have process based and I'm going to bring up evaluations again. I really think evaluations are foundational to any kind of measure, kind of the kind of um, risk based triaging that Cristobal kind of brought up for the kind of transparency reporting we're talking about and for self-management to know whether your systems are robust or not. And I feel like that's a huge area of research that many organizations are putting their kind of money into. And I'm excited to see more kind of regulations or at least kind of statements by governments that this is actually an area of investment that we need to put into and it will flow into the kind of standards that Apostle is bringing up. Evaluations, I think, are an endless place of, of um, additional research. Okay, so we have uh, stakeholder engagement, evaluations, robustness of those evaluations. Christabel. Um, I agree with a lot, a lot that has been said. I think uh, both the regulation and technology should be an open and participatory process. I think there should be transparency in governance and transparency in development and deployment um, of these systems. Thank you. And Apostle, what are you going to leave us on today? Okay, a quick one on science. Um, Oh, it's always good models. to end on science. <laughs> I mean, yes. Okay. Um, so foundation models are evolving fast, but so is science about them. And we are starting to understand science tells us the limitations of certain, let's say, favorite uh, mitigation techniques around risk management. So where are the boundaries? What is possible? What is not? Having this knowledge help us refine our standards, our guidance, and that's very valuable. And so I welcome the overall um, initiative to provide more research into this space. And the academic community is really doing a great job of that. Uh, so we need to incorporate this newly uh, emerging scientific knowledge into standards and best practices. Great. Thank you so much. It's always good to have evidence-based policymaking. I wish for more of it at the federal and state level in the United States. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining me today. I'm going to pass it now to my colleague, Jessica Newman, to close us out. Thank you. Thank you so much to Brandy and all of the speakers for a fantastic discussion. I was particularly excited to hear the emphasis on evaluation and transparency requirements for general purpose AI systems and how we need greater communication and dialogue about the impacts, about the data, about the model design, key limitations, and really help determine what are the boundaries of acceptable use and to enable more people to be part of meaningful decision making for the development and deployment of impactful AI systems. Uh, so thank you again to all the speakers for joining us. We're excited to hear that people and organizations see this profile as filling an important role in the broader AI governance landscape. Uh, so now let me share a few final thoughts. Um, first of all, version 1.0 of the profile is now available as a free resource. I know the link's been shared a few times in the chat. Um, please use it, share it, and let us know how we can make it better. Uh, we're interested in feedback from everyone and uh, in particular from those who are trying to apply it. So please let us know about that work and uh, email us or reach out with any questions or feedback that you might have. We're, we're always happy to talk to teams about the work. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to conclude our event today. Uh, thank you all for joining us and for the great questions. Take care.